This is our first stop in our beautiful dreamlike city. It is the very place where the Pharaonic King Akhenaten or Akhenaton established the capital of his kingdom, Akhetaton or Akhetetin. He found it in the sixth year of his reign in 1390 BC. He shows this site, in particular, to honor the god Aton to make it represent the sun disk. Akhenaten placed 14 huge stone paintings all around the city to serve as borders to his new capital. After the palaces, temples and residential areas were fully established, Akhenaten left Thebes and moved to Akhetaton. He ordered for the establishment of a tomb for his wife Nefertiti, his daughter Mariatan, and for himself. He also agreed to let his senior aides be buried in the same tomb. We climbed the hills to get into the tomb of Merira, the main priest in the temple of Aton and the king's chief judge in Upper Egypt. Here we see some beautiful drawings engraved in the walls. It depicts the owner of this tomb and portrays Echnaton and his striking wife Nefertiti. The sun here symbolizes the god. According to Akhenaten, through the rays of the sun, everything that lived had its being. And for this reason, Akhenaten vowed never to part with his sun worship kingdom even after his death. The scenes engraved in the walls established a new trend of art. It came to be known as the Amarna art. Akhenaten's call for monotheism ushered in a revolutionary movement in religion, politics, social systems, and art. Artists, for example, were given entire freedom to abandon conventions and to break away from the rigid formality of earlier official depiction. This proves that Akhenaten was ahead of his time as his ideas have echoed through the ages. He was the first to introduce the monotheistic culture and the realistic art. He was also completely against racial discrimination. That was how Akhenaten's land of dreams was like. This is a city named Tal al Amanna, which was built by Akhenaton for his wife Nefertiti, and they lived over here for around 25 years. Akhenaton was a very well known king who was fighting actually discrimination and was calling all the time for peace for his people. While leaving the place, we watched a dazzling natural scene. We saw the mountains taking the shape of half the sun disk right in front of the life-giving River Nile. It's a scene that combines the splendor of nature and the greatness of history. We then left the city of dreams and headed towards the ferry that would take us to the western bank of the Nile in our quest for another dream. Almenia witnessed a lot of love stories from the past which included Isadora's death when she drowned into the river Nile. On our way, the Nile whispered to us the story of the Maid of the Nile, which is the story of love and affection. Once upon a time, in the old Roman Empire, a young lady called Isadora, who was the daughter of a bank merchant, fell in love with a young man from Ashmonim. Owing to his high position, the father refused to let his daughter marry the one she fell for. 
so she made up her mind to run away with her lover. Isadora took a boat and headed towards her lover, who waited for her at the other bank. Once she caught sight of him, she got so excited that the boat lost balance and she fell into the river and drowned. We decided to go and see the place that immortalizes Isadora's dream. We went to a village called Tunal Gaval in Minya Government. The Antiquity Authority calls it the Western Hermopolis, as it's considered the city of the dead. We proceeded to Isadora's grave that dates back to 120 BC. It was built by her lover who carved on it a poem expressing his grief for the death of his beloved. So many years ran by till Dr. Sami Gabra, the head of an archaeology group, discovered the tomb. The discovery came in 1930. We noticed that there were flocks of tourists at that spot. Something that made us more curious to explore the place. We got into the vaults and went down the stairs that led into the ground floor which was five meters deep. The vault comprises long roads and many gates. No one could tell how long it is. We were told that the foreign group covered a distance of 15 kilometers Yet, they couldn't reach its end. Those vaults were designed as a grave for the god Tahut, the god of knowledge and wisdom. At the entrance of the vault lies the tomb of the mummified monkey which symbolizes Goat Tahut. We went out of the vaults with some tourists. So I've had a wonderful day here. It's just been uh, uh, seeing all of these beautiful sights. The tombs have such beautiful pictures there. They come alive on the walls. They're, ju they're just absolutely magnificent and glorious. Um, the the sites here. Um, they are not well visited and it's just a shame it really is because everyone should see the things that are here all of the majesty and the glory that is here should be seen well, uh, a year ago we came for the first time just as a as an overnight we stayed one night in Minya and when I saw the tombs at Beni Hassan and I saw the nobles tombs at uh, Tel Amarna, I just said I have to bring people here it's just magnificent there were also the remains of the temple of God Tahut. On the east side of the temple, there is the tomb of God Tahut's chief priest, Pitazoius. The tomb was built in 200 BC. It was meant to be an eternal abode for him and his father, Sisho, and also for his brother and his daughters. It was Gustave Le Kif who discovered this temple-like tomb in 1920. The scenes on the walls of this miniature temple revealed how our old ancestors used to cultivate their lands. They also showed us their daily life activities and how they imagined the afterlife. The tomb includes a number of pharaonic, Greek and Roman scenes. It also depicts the story of the resurrection of Osiris. The coffin of Patizoius was found inside the tomb and was taken of the Egyptian museum. We left Tunal Gabal village and went to Ashmonin, which was only 8 kilometers away. 
The history of this area dates back to 2000 BC. It was called the Eternal Hill, as it was considered the city of immortality. This city, which witnessed a lot of ages and eras, like the Ptolemaic era, is full of monuments. The first thing we saw in that city were the remains of a church that had the Balzac style as clear from its granite columns. When the sun began to set, silence reigned in the place in a public garden full of many other statues from different ages. The park was lighted in a wonderful way that gave life to the still statues. This park is a splendid manifestation of the great Egyptian history. that location, a pyramid drew our attention. The pyramid is said to be the oldest in the world. We were eager to know more about the pyramid and its founder, but unfortunately it was getting late and we had to leave. On the following day, we watched a spectacular scenery as the sun was rising from behind the mountains and the Nile River seemed as if it was embracing the sun rays. We decided to seek the help of an archaeologist, so we turned to Mr. Samir Anas. Together we went back to the pyramid. Strangely enough, the pyramid looked different in the morning. The archaeologist Samir Anas began to tell us about the history of this pyramid. This is the city, one of the most important capitals during the pharaonic period. The main features of this area is a, a step pyramid dated to the early period of the Old Kingdom. Also, we have two tombs dated to the Old, King, Old Kingdom also and the Neo Kingdom period. This the capital of the main cemetery, which located around 20 kilometers southeast of this area. This is the capital and the tombs of the nobles of this area lies in Bani Hassan. It's a good example of the development of the construction of pyramids in Egypt. It also stands for persistence and steadfastness. This pyramid, named Zawiyat Sultan, or a Sultan's Corner, is situated 10 kilometers away from Minya. After that, we moved to a nearby ancient area called Beni Hassan. We